so uh, what today? Again, today we are here, Tuesday 8, uh, and today will be presentation of three people after the lecture, do not forget, and also will be test maybe in a half an hour. Uh, so, uh, when we're talking about uh, uh, toxicity on organism level, it's important to discuss some uh, things connected with biodistribution. So, when we're talking about cells and toxicity on cell level, we didn't discuss how uh, nanoparticles uh, um, came to the cell, so how do they meet, and, and uh, all of the consequences already uh, on the uh, on the stage when we have some nanoparticles inside our cells, uh, but we and we, when we are talking about the whole organism, it's important to understand how these particles can come to this tissue, to this organ, and to the cells. And if we're talking about nanotoxicology, it's uh, different types of nanotoxicity, and one of this type if is. Uh, biodistribution related toxicity. So it's uh, tissue toxicity, uh, well, genotoxicity, cellular toxicity, molecular toxicity, all of these uh, kind of toxicities we already discussed in previous lectures, but uh, today we will discuss a bit, uh, maybe even not uh, about a toxicity to a whole uh, organ, because toxicity, for example, to liver, uh, uh, connected, uh, strictly connected with toxicity to hepatocytes, for example. So, toxicity to a whole organ definitely connected with toxicity to separate cells. Uh, but we'll discuss how different organs uh, functionalized and so on. Uh, so, uh, why biodistribution is so important? Because when we're talking again about the cells, so in vitro culture and some nanoparticles uh, on the top of your cells, you cannot understand how the viability so we have some decrease in viability for example by 20 percent and what does this mean to a whole organ to a tissue so if 20 percent of nanoparticles no no uh, if you have decrease in viability by 20 percent so it may be 20 percent of the nanoparticles are dead maybe they have just a uh, lowered uh, amount of protein uh, prote proteins or something like this one so it's very hard questions to answer and for this one we need some in vivo models to understand what happened to an organ to a you know, tissue when we inject some particles inside an organism and there's a lot of different organs uh, which can uh, which need to be assessed because they are known to be the uh, main accumula uh, accumulators of uh, different kind of nanoparticles. So it's kidneys, spleen, it's a lungs, liver, well, in some ca ca cases in blood, uh, and uh, testes and ovary and also brain uh, can be assessed. But, uh, well, some of these organs can accumulate, some not. Uh, for example, brain cannot accumulate particles because most of the particles cannot pass blood-brain barrier. Uh, and for example, testes uh, also can accumulate particles, but it definitely or will cause some uh, reprodu uh, reproductive toxicity outcomes and so on. Uh, and to assess uh, uh, outcomes of the use of, uh, from the use of nanoparticles, we need some histopathology uh, examination. So it's a different uh, hematoxylin staining. It's special staining for for example, iron nanoparticles or gold nanoparticles and so on, and we'll discuss it later. Uh, what are the ways to enter human body? Uh, you already have this uh, uh, question uh, in introductory tests, so there's a lot of ways. Uh, well, it's probably a natural ways to enter the body, so with the food, with the water, with the breathing air, with some, I don't know, with the rain water, uh, if something can uh, be released in air, it definitely can then come back with the water and came to uh, enter your body through the skin, for example, so skin irritation, and through the skin it can uh, go through, uh, to the liver, to with pesticides it can go to your stomach, uh, and uh, it can further go to different uh, cardiovascular organs and so on. So it's a lot of ways to enter human body. It's uh, our body may be well protected, but not from nanoparticles. Uh, 
Uh, and one of the uh, most important in our population, one of the most important pathways, and not all of uh, all of you probably familiar with this one, is called olfactory pathway. So olfactory nerve, uh, it's our nerve that help us to, uh, well, to understand some smells. Uh, and it's located in our nose, and this nerve is directly connected with the brain. And if you inhale some particles, nanoparticles, they will go directly to the brain, uh, and they don't need even to uh, cross a blood-brain barrier. So there's a lot of nanoparticles from a uh, car, cars from a factories uh, and so on and uh, this one is from uh, uh, some of the recent papers uh, we will discuss probably this uh, papers and environmental pollution on the last lecture so it's a lot of magnetic nanoparticles were found in the brain of um, people who live in, in close proximity to iron mines uh, and uh, magnetite, magnetic iron nanoparticles in your brain is uh, not one of the healthiest options, of course. Uh, but uh, if we're talking about how nanoparticles can, well, uh, in case some nanoparticles enter your body, they will probably need to penetrate your capillary system, your vessel system, uh, to penetrate epithelial layer, maybe uh, some mucus layer, in case uh, you have uh, this, uh, particles in your, for example, nose, yes. Uh, and in most cases, uh, when we're talking about different membranes, I mean not membranes of the cell, but membranes of our organism, for example, our skin. So we have some layer of dead cells on the surface of our skin, but under this dead layer we have some living cells and there's a lot of different layers uh, uh, in our skin for example uh, but not only in uh, on our skin but for example every capillary every vessel have endocellular uh, endocellular layer and uh, what's so important uh, we have not only cells but also we have some space between these cells and these cells, uh, well, uh, this space called a junction. So uh, uh, if we have some particles which need to penet uh, penetrate, for example, our blood vessel or something like this, they have two options. First option, they can enter the cell and end in this cell. So it's lysosomal degradation of some kind. But as I already mentioned on previous lecture, uh, in some cases these particles can uh, escape endosomes and they can damage a cell membrane, for example, or just not uh, damage. They can exit these particles using exosomes and they will penetrate this barrier. So uh, for some of the cells it doesn't matter from what, uh, what uh, side to uh, throw out these particles so they can throw out them randomly to any direction and in some cases they can uh, cause this barrier but there's also a third option uh, and the third option is called paracellular transport so transcellular transport is transport through cell paracellular transport is transport between cells uh, and this uh, space uh, covered with different uh, proteins and this space is very tight because it's called tight junctions uh, and it's very hard to penetrate this space but still it's possible and in some cases these tight junctions are increasing especially in case of different inflammations uh, especially in case of heating for example if you hit the blood-brain barrier it's an, uh, also an option to, well, open these tight junctions a bit. Uh, and some of the, for example, this one is for pamam dendemers. So pamam dendemers can penetrate these tight junctions by disrupt some disruptance of these proteins and so on. So it's, a lot, uh, it's different options for nanoparticles to enter your body and you can uh, and, uh, you can't feel yourself protected when we're talking about different nanoparticles. So Next time, when you're using some sunscreens when, uh, with titanium dioxide particles, uh, you must remember that they can enter the body and accumulate somewhere in your liver, for example. 
Uh, but we talked a lot uh, already about different kind of inflammation and probably not all of you familiar with what the inflammation is. Because if we are talking about inflammation on macro level, so on the level of a whole organism, uh, well, there is definitely some micro signs of inflammation. And uh, there is five uh, cardinal signs of inflammation that can be found in your body. Uh, and uh, this uh, pain, heat, redness, swelling and loss of function. So uh, pain is not always uh, accompanied inflammation because if you have, for example, lungs inflammation, uh, lungs inflammation in most of the cases have no pain, uh, pain symptoms uh, in most of the cases, not all the cases, because there is no pain nerves in your lungs. And uh, but in most of the cases, yeah, pain and inflammation, it's the synonyms. Uh, and if you look uh, what is the uh, symptom and sign and what is the cause, uh, the three of these signs are closely connected. It's a heat, redness and swelling. So what is swelling? You can see here and you uh, probably see some redness around this uh, around this fruit uh, and uh, all of these three signs are connected with vasodilation so it's a increase in capillary size so your capillaries increase in diameter and uh, with this one connected increased vascular permeability so why all of this needed because if you have some inflammation it means something bad happened to your organism maybe it's bacteria Maybe it's a virus, maybe it's some physical damage and your uh, lycocytes, uh, macrophages and other cells which are intended to combat these intruders, let's say bacteria, they need to come in your foot, uh, finger, I don't know, elbow like here. And they need to combat this bacteria. But to penetrate all of these tight junctions, cells and so on, they need to penetrate them uh, faster to eliminate the threat, threat. And uh, for all of this, uh, your organism performs some, uh, starts some mechanism like vasodilation. So your capillary increases uh, and there's a lot of liquid enter your damaged, damaged limb and uh, with all of this liquid, with uh, blood, some of the macrophages, uh, lycocytes can enter your uh, injured limb and eliminate the threat. So now heat, redness and swelling are all interconnected. So, but if we're talking about the last one, it's a loss of function. So now, when we are talking about food, for example, or arm, or maybe some just a hand, uh, uh, loss of function can be not complete loss of function. It depends on uh, stage of inflammation. If this uh, last stage of inflammation, uh, well, definitely you will not able even to, I don't know, uh, shake your hand or something like this on but in most of the cases loss of function means that you have some pain when you lift a very heavy uh, something heavy or you can uh, you can walk but you can jump uh, you can run for example but walking with, uh, well with some pain but you still can walk uh, and this means uh, partially loss of function but this is a micro science of inflammation and what happened when we are talking about micro signs of inflammation? Because every inflammation starts from something on cellular level. And well, micro signs of inflammation are very simple, as you can see from this scheme, because it's obvious what happens to your organism when we are talking about inflammation. Of course, joke, because uh, probably even I cannot understand everything that's going on this picture. But if we are talking about inflammation on cellular level, you need to understand some uh, basic uh, key principles of inflammation and key uh, participants of inflammation. Uh, probably some of them are familiar to you. Uh, if we are looking on this picture, uh, we definitely see some M1, M2 and MF uh, cells. So this one is not a Russian letter F, it's a Greek letter F and this is a uh, designation for macrophage. 
So macrophages can be a tissue macrophages, also called residual macrophages, and they are located in tissues. It's also some circulating macrophages which are located in blood. And in case of inflammation, uh, circulating macrophages can penetrate a, a barrier, so in the cellular barrier, enter your damaged tissue and become residual or tissue macrophages. M1 and M2 is also macrophages phenotypes which involved in different stages of inflammation. But uh, also there are some neutrophils uh, and monocytes which are also the cells that uh, accompany inflammation and elimination of inflammation and mast cell also involved. And if we look on different molecules which are needed uh, on different stages of inflammation, you will probably somewhere least uh, heard, read, or I don't know, meet in some papers, some molecules which are usually assessed when we are talking about in vivo toxicity. So it's interleukin 1 beta, it's a tumor necrosis factor, it's different kind of chemokines, now uh, it's maybe MCP1, MPO, it's, um, well, acetylcholine, uh, uh, where, where, uh, NF-kappa B. So it's a lot of different molecules which participated in inflammation on cellular level. And most of these molecules, like this one, called chemokines and cytokines. So these molecules are needed to attract, for example, leukocytes from uh, your blood to a damaged tissue. So these molecules mm, uh, uh, create a gradient. So um, when leukocyte sees this gradient of chemokines in your tissue, uh, leukocyte know where to move to eliminate, for example, some bacteria. So if you're looking on a, a much simpler uh, much simpler scheme, for example, what happened in case of virus infection? Some virus enter your body. Uh, well, in the very, very good case, this virus will be immediately phagocyted by macrophages in a place of enter. But in most of the cases, this virus will go to some cell. Uh, so the cell will, will become infected and this will lead, for example, to cell death or maybe cell damage or something like this one. And the cell will understand that something bad happened and they will release some inflammatory signals. These inflammatory signals will be understood by a macrophage, residual macrophages in these tissues. And these macrophages will release some chemokines or inflammatory cytokines and this will cause a recruitment of T cells, lymphocytes, and so on. And when these T cells uh, will eliminate the danger, uh, they will release uh, inflammatory, uh, inflammatory cytokine feedback to macrophage. So macrophage will understand that the uh, danger is eliminated and there is no need to release no, more chemokines. So it's uh, called a synergistic augmentation of inflammation, self-regulated system. So it's a very, very uh, uh, easy explanation on, on what can happen to your organism when something bad happens. Uh, and uh, instead of virus infection, can be nanoparticles, obviously, it can be some physical damage or some other kind of damage, bacterial damage. Uh, even maybe some uh, cell, uh, maybe some, I don't know, cells dying from heat or cold, for example, if you have some uh, some damage, physical damage to your organism, it can cause uh, can also cause uh, inflammatory response. Uh, and uh, just uh, one example for you to understand how this system do not work properly in our organism. It's a commonly known atherosclerosis formation. So uh, in case of atherosclerosis, we have some inflammation in our blood vessel wall. Uh, and what happened in this blood vessel wall? So uh, there's uh, everything starting with uh, uh, everything starting with cholesterol crystals. So these crystals are not very healthy for our organism. So some monocytes uh, getting recruited to a uh, to a vessel wall and they undergo transformation to a macrophages, which trying to eliminate these cholesterol crystals. 
But upon interaction with Halsterine, they undergo transformation to a foam cells, so they definitely go to inactivate state, and these foam cells cannot escape this wall, and they die inside a vessel wall. And this uh, and dying of the cells, uh, as uh, I mentioned here, dying of the cells uh, lead to recruitment of uh, more macrophages and more and more, and a lot of macrophages enter your uh, vessel wall, and you have inflammation inside your vessel wall, and this inflammation, uh, well, basically it's at atherosclerosis. So it's a, a system with a positive feedback. So. Uh, the more inflammation, the more macrophages. The more macrophages, the more inflammation. And there is no way to treat it for now. So atherosclerosis is a cause of a uh, third of our population deaths every year. Uh, so inflammation is very, very important and very, very dangerous. So uh, liver is the main organ which accumulate nanoparticles along with the spleen and kidneys. But when we are talking about uh, nanoparticles, well, most of the studies studying with the liver toxicity. Uh, and uh, I'm not a best specialist in explaining what uh, histology, histopathology, and uh, other things, uh, how it's working and how it should be explained, but still I will do my best to explain how the liver and other organs work. So uh, I hope that everyone knows where the liver is located in your organism. So liver, uh, as long uh, as well as other uh, monocyte uh, uh, phagocytic system organs, uh, it involved in filtration of your blood. So uh, one of the main part of the liver is so-called liver sinusoid. Uh, why it called sinusoid? Because it maybe in some way looks like a sinusoid. So. Uh, it's a large amount of different channels uh, which are covered by endothelial cells and on the surface of these endothelial cells located Kupfer cells. So if you're looking on enlarged image, as you can see, it's uh, endothelial cells. It's a uh, very big Kupfer cells. Uh, it's uh, uh, the space where they uh, they located so-called sinusoidal lumen and uh, on the opposite side, the DC space and uh, some dendritic cells and hepatocytes. So hepatocytes is the main cells of the liver and maybe it's like 80-85% of the liver is hepatocytes. Uh, so uh, when something uh, uh, came with the blood in your liver, uh, the Kupfer cells is the first cells to interact with different nanoparticles. So it's, uh, well, Kupfer cells and uh, circulating macrophages in your blood, but Kupfer cells uh, is the first one to starting to eliminate nanoparticles came with this blood. Uh, so if something bad happened to Kupfer cells, uh, Kupfer cells uh, will not able to filtrate, for example, other toxicants, uh, damaged cells, uh, different pathogens, bacteria, and so on. Uh, if you look in how it looks on histology uh, samples, well, the liver sinusoid looking uh, something like this one, very similar to him. Uh, and uh, as you can see, most of the cells are hepatocytes and, well, there's some erythrocytes in the lumen, uh, but uh, if we're looking on uh, how it looking more, uh, even more precisely uh, with the with the arrow uh, with the red color, it's a staining for Kupfer uh, cells, so they are relatively big. Uh, and the rest of the cells uh, uh, stain it with blue here is a hepatocyte, so it's uh, just a wall of the liver sinusoid. Uh, so the main toxicity uh, comes here from two factors. Uh, first one is the death of Kupfer cells. So here you can see electron image of a Kupfer cells with a very large, uh, large late endosome, uh, which is filled with uh, some kind of particles. I, I think this is some kind of metal particles. Uh, and this Kupfer cells, it, it's very hard to say is it dead or not because it's an electron image, but it's definitely a lot of different nanoparticles inside the cell. And now uh, this is a cell problem to eliminate these particles and in case of different inert particles, maybe like gold nanoparticles, uh, it will be very hard for this cell to eliminate it. But what will happen in case 
<coughs> if some of cupra cells dying and even further in case if some of the endothelial cells dying so if you look on this scheme uh, what can happen first of all uh, first of all uh, if cupra cell dying it can cause some apoptosis uh, cupra cells activation and a list of inflammatory signals and release of inflammatory signals as uh, i told you earlier will uh, re uh, result in inflammation of uh, liver and the recruitment of different uh, uh, macrophages and lycocytes and so on but most important the most important part is the loss of function so liver will lose part of its uh, part of uh, of its function so it cannot uh, filter your blood and uh, it can uh, lead to accumulation of different toxins and intoxication of the whole organism and so on and so on just imagine what will happen if you drink some uh, alcohol with nanoparticles inside of it so it will definitely be a big problem uh, and what will happen next uh, if we're talking about damage of endothelial cells well uh, some nanoparticles can penetrate further through this space to hepatocytes and damage these hepatocytes and this will definitely lead to a very major inflammation inside the uh, liver tissue so and uh, here's some uh, several outcomes of uh, damaging of hepatocytes uh, well it's uh, uh, disorder hepatocyte rows because hepatocyte mainly placed in special rows because they also act in filtration of the blood and so on so it disrupted liver structure it's a liver fibrosis as well as lung fibrosis in some cases so liver will, uh, will lose its function for probably the rest of your life uh, and uh, this is a very very important concern so when we're talking about uh, inflammation uh, of liver and accumulation of nanoparticles in liver uh, the side effects can be very dangerous uh, but liver well it's uh, almost all clear with the liver because you know, when we have some big particles they will definitely go to liver or to spleen and accumulate in liver and spleen but uh, i told you about very small particles previously and the small nanoparticles will definitely go to a kidney so if the size of nanoparticles are very very small uh, they will escape Kupfer cells, they will escape spleen uh, vessels, and they will go to kidneys. Uh, and, well, how kidney working is even more complicated compared to liver. Uh, well, we have two kidneys, uh, and kidney uh, also uh, acting as a blood filtration organ. Uh, in kidneys, uh, the main part of the kidneys is nephrons. So, nephrons... Uh, have a very complex structure but to understand how uh, how the is working you need to go to one specific part of the nephron called corpuscle so in this corpuscle renal corpuscle uh, it consists of uh, how uh, this showed just a three uh, as far as i know it could be different from a three but it called this spherical uh, spherical compartments called glomerulus so uh, if we go even further as you can see it's filtration and well some blood comes here some filtrations come out uh, what is a filtra filtrate so uh, uh, these corpuscles produce ultra filtrate so it's a primary urine as I uh, remember uh, remember it correctly so uh, after this corpuscle there can be nothing uh, bigger than a protein even a protein can bypass this uh, filter system. So if you ever have some uh, uh, medical uh, medical analysis of the urine, you know that uh, there's some uh, some point about uh, proteins in urine because in a healthy state there should be no proteins because proteins cannot escape this renal corpuscle. So if you have some proteins in you in the urine, it's something bad happened to your kidneys. Uh, and uh, if we are going further and look more detailedly on this uh, glomerulus, uh, the structure looks very nice, but if we are uh, looking more precise, uh, what it looks like? Uh, well, it's definitely some kind of uh, cells, uh, cell layers, uh, intercellular cells and uh, podocytes. And if we look even further uh, and enhance this part, so we already enhance so already from a, a kidney to nephron to corpuscle to a glomerulus 
and now we came to glomerulus filtration membrane so this is the part that really filter your blood and uh, this is one uh, which uh, is uh, working to get you healthy uh, in a normal state with a normal uh, renal profile so if we look in on glomerulus filtration membrane it is very very narrow gaps between two uh, types of this membrane so on the first side as you can see blood vessel here uh, on the side uh, turned to a blood vessel uh, we will have some endothelial cells and some glycocalyx so glycocalyx uh, is also used to entrap some particles and so on but uh, looking from this side uh, the uh, distance between these endothelial cells it is like uh, uh, 70 90 nanometers but on this uh, opposite side of this membrane as you can see uh, the size between two podocyte as we, we will see here it's a podocyte it's a very big cell uh, and this one is podocyte let's say legs so between this uh, podocyte legs the space is like maybe 4 11 nanometers and the pore size uh, of this membrane uh, in total can be like 2 to 8 nanometers. So as you can see, uh, uh, even, uh, even uh, protein cannot bypass this filter. So if you have some particles which are very big and they uh, by any means escape your liver and your spleen, they will definitely end up in this filtration system. And if they will damage this filtration system, you will have a really big problem with your health. Uh, if we look on a uh, uh, histology uh, image of, of how glomerulus looks like, as you can see, uh, glomerulus on the scheme and glomerulus on the hist histopathology sample. But uh, if we look further, what will happen to, uh, so what will bypass this one and what will happen to ultra uh, filtration? So as you can see, filtration direction showed here. So uh, next, after nephron, after this corpuscle, you will have some tubal system. And uh, on the first one, you have a primary uh, urine here. And this one goes further, 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 well, to the very exit. And if something happened here bad uh, with uh, your uh, renal corpuscle, something will happen to a whole system. Because as you can see, uh, after the first filtration, uh, organism still able to obtain a lot of nutrients out of ultrafiltrate. So it can be uh, glucose, it can be some kind of water because <clears throat> up to maybe 80% of water uh, recycled again uh, and uh, on the exit we have a lot of different uh, ions uh, which is needed for organisms uh, so they uh, can be again obtained from this ultrafiltrate. So uh, kidneys works uh, very hard to uh, produce uh, some additional nutrients for our organism and uh, remove some toxicants and so on but uh, I talked uh, previously about some pack drawbacks and uh, when you have pegylated particles, pegylated particles can uh, escape most of the uh, most of the organs, especially liver, because liver don't have a mechanical filtration. As you can see here, it's kind of mechanical filtration. So it does some gaps, some uh, gaps between podocytes, between endothelial cells. And if we look on liver, there is no gaps. There is just a kupfer cell that can lie home and uptake some nanoparticles. So uh, if uh, you use pegylated particles, they can easily escape uptake by kupfer cells. They will end up in uh, glomerulus filtration membrane. And what will happen to this membrane? Now, if you look on healthy state of uh, kidney tissue, you will see some tubulus, so this uh, this voids and this uh, holes, let's say, uh, this tu it's a tubulus. Uh, and uh, what happened if you have some pegylated particles? Uh, I probably, I hope that you see that the difference between these histology samples is very uh, very big because there is no tubulus at all. There is a lot of uh, cytoplasmic vocalization, so it's a lot of different vocals in the cells and vocalization of cells 
uh, is a very bad sign uh, of a cell viability because some of the tubules even almost closed. So it's a sign of inflammation in your kidneys. Uh, and if we look on some uh, not black and white images, but on colored images, again about kidneys, uh, well, uh, uh, kidneys on uh, under letter B, and as you can see, uh, pegylated particles strongly accumulate in endothelial cells of, a kid uh, of kidney, in endothelial cells of these tubules. But also, as you can see, it's a, a, a very strong accumulation of pegylated particles in all other tissues, for example, in heart, in uh, lungs, uh, in some ways. Uh, and again, there's some uh, even more... Uh, even more uh, badly, uh, badly colored images of damage done to a kidney. So, as you can see here, the structure, this tubule, uh, and how it's covered with pegylated particles. So, uh, <laughs> now, till this moment, no one knows what can, hap uh, what can happen to your kidneys uh, when you have so many uh, pegylated particles in your endothelial cells, which uh, line the, uh, your tubules in kidneys. So it will definitely lead to some damage. So when we're talking about uh, biocompatibility of pegylated particles, uh, well, it's not true because some of them are strongly accumulated in kidneys. Uh, and uh, just imagine to accumulate here, they should bypass, bypass here. So it's probably some damage done to this membrane too. No, because there is no way to pass this membrane without damage if the size of particles like 50 nanometers. Uh, <clears throat> so it's a lot of damage can be done to kidneys and about, uh, it just here about some uh, uh, also danger of PEC molecules, uh, just as I uh, told you uh, when explaining the results of previous tests. Uh, uh, here is from the paper describing uh, using of pegylated aptamers uh, as anticoagulant uh, therapy. So, uh, anticoagulant therapy used to uh, uh, to treat to for prophylaxis of, for example, thrombosis. Uh, and uh, well, without some kind of therapy, we will definitely have some thrombosis. But if you have some pegylated aptamers, they will work nice. Everything is good, but just one time, because after the first injection of something pegylated, you will have some antibodies. And if you inject pegylated aptamers again, there will be anti-peg antibody, and this anti-peg antibody will, uh, will decrease to a zero efficiency of your aptamers, and they will lead to a thrombosis. So if you have some long-term uh, long therapy using some pegylated molecules, uh, well, it's always uh, a possibility, very high possibility, that the second injection, uh, so a long-term ther uh, therapy, will lead to some uh, unwanted consequences, like here you inject a drug and you have some thrombosis in your organism. So, uh, for now, pegylated particles are used very, very... Uh, limitedly uh, when uh, when we are talking about some in vivo applications. They still study it, but as you can see, there's a lot of drawbacks. So we need to move further to a splint toxicity. So uh, I hope everyone knows where the liver located, kidneys located, but probably not all of you know where spleen located. So spleen located somewhere under your stomach and uh, spleen, it's a lymph organ. And uh, what are the functions of a spleen? So spleen produce a lot of platelets, thrombocytes, uh, and also uh, a spleen act as a filtration organ. And uh, why? Why spleen is so good in filtration? Because spleen is not very big. So compared to a liver, as you can see, liver here, and spleen here. But if we are talking about how many nanoparticles will accumulate in spleen and in the liver, uh, spleen will accumulate more nanoparticles uh, per gram of tissue. So uh, the liver is just bigger in mass, but the spleen is more effective in filtration. So the spleen is maybe in some cases even more uh, primary target of uh, nanoparticles toxicity than the liver. 
Why? Uh, well, everything connected with the structure of a spleen. So, uh, spleen uh, consisted of two types, uh, well, of course, more than two types, but two main types of tissues. This tissue is called white pulp and red pulp. So red pulp is most of the tissue, uh, most of the tissues uh, is a red pulp, but what is white pulp? White pulp uh, consisted of lycocytes. So it's main cells which uptake different pathogens in our organism. And as you can see, white pulp mainly surrounding uh, our vessels in the spleen. So uh, arterial blood comes here, venous blood comes out. And uh, when some arterial blood with nanoparticles enter your spleen, the first one to encounter of this blood is white pulp filled with lycocyte, and this lycocyte will definitely uptake some of the nanoparticles. And more important, how the filtration of spleen works, because what is red pulp? Red pulp formed from the endocellular cells, and the cells act as a mechanical filter for nanoparticles. So some of the blood filtrated through the cells and uh, then accumulated in the uh, venous and go to the organism. So if something happen, uh, if something stuck in this uh, white, uh, red pulp, uh, it will uh, lead to some inflammation, for example. So uh, to eliminate this particle, you will need definitely some macrophages and uh, to uh, uh, allow some macrophages to come into the spleen, it, it should start some inflammation process. But also what is so important about filtration of spleen, it's a structure of spleen sinusoids. So uh, sinusoids, it's a, a kind of a spleen vessels. Uh, and the spleen vessels, uh, uh, I think it's obvious question how all of our cells, I mean blood cells, uh, bypass all of this filtration system. So for example, uh, erythrocytes, so red blood cells, they are very big, uh, they are much bigger than any of the nanoparticles. So it's like, uh, it's shown uh, on this scheme how erythrocytes can bypass this uh, filter. They uh, like uh, squeezing through the pores, through the holes uh, in uh, spleen sinusoids. So when we are talking about some biomimetic particles, in some way biomimetic particles in the form of uh, red blood cells can also mimic this uh, bypassing this squeezing but uh, to uh, uh, it's not uh, for uh, if you have a very strong a hard core of these particles just covered with the membrane there is no, there is no options to squeeze so these nanoparticles cannot squeeze and bypass this filtration system as uh, uh, native erythrocytes can. So some of the nanoparticles stuck on this stage, but in case of small nanoparticles, they still can bypass this sinusoid and uh, well, they will be filtrated by a uh, spleen tissue. So again, some nanoparticles uh, in spleen endocellular cells in red pulp, some inflammation of spleen. Well, it's a lot of problems with the spleen. But uh, again, how it's looking on, for example, uh, histology uh, images. I know not of all of you, uh, probably not all of, uh, probably even all of you uh, are not familiar with the histology and there's a lot of letters. I just, uh, uh, so I just pick some uh, words and uh, in bold, so for you to be a bit easier to understand what I will talk in next. Uh, here is a contour uh, image of a spleen, just for you to remember how the contour spleen looks like. So it's some kind of white pulp and red pulp. They have different staining when they stain it with hematoxylin and eosin staining. Now, after three days, there is no much difference in spleen, but after two weeks of treatment, and uh, by the way, this is a treatment, uh, this uh, red, uh, which uh, were covered, so some red with some uh, injury, and this injury uh, was covered by a uh, wound dressing with silver nanoparticles, so just very common silver nanoparticles, antibacterial activity, and so on, but after three weeks of treatment, uh, it's definitely a lot of megakaryocytes in, uh, in spleen. Uh, what is megakaryocyte? Uh, as you can see here, it's a very, very big cell. 
and megakaryocyte is the main uh, cell which produce platelets so thrombocytes so, uh, uh, and uh, megakaryocyte produce platelets as a part of its own membrane so platelets is just a part of megakaryocyte membrane platelets don't have nucleus and so on so if you have a lot of megakaryocytes and well spleen accumulate thrombocytes so if you have a lot of megakaryocytes in your spleen then you probably will have a lot more thrombocytes and this means increased chance of thrombosis in some parts of your organism so it can lead to some very severe consequences maybe to strokes or something like this one and this is only after two weeks and after six weeks i hope you see there's a uh, uh, so big difference between a uh, control tissue and the normal t uh, control normal tissue healthy tissue and the tissue of a spleen after six weeks it's just a wound dressing what can happen well a lot of things can happen now uh, because after six weeks uh, it's a vocalization of cells it's uh, a much more uh, high concentration of megakaryocytes and something like this one so uh silver nanoparticle can easily penetrate the skin accumulate in the spleen and uh, lead to a large amount of consequences in your organs and also if we look on the liver uh, here uh, the same uh, the same purpose the same particles the same wound dressing with uh, silver particles now uh, liver of controls uh, control animals there is no difference it's hepatocytes uh, but even after three days, uh, after three days, uh, a little oscillation, so you hear some sp uh, see some spaces here. But after two weeks, uh, it's a lymphocyte infiltration, and uh, lymphocyte infiltration means there's some inflammation already starting in the liver. So it's some vocal de uh, de uh, degeneration. So some of the cells uh, became uh, start to accumulate vocals and so on. And after six weeks, uh, as you can see, it's a lot of uh, de uh, de uh, degeneration of hepatocytes, degeneration of portal vein walls. So it's damage to a vein wall. So it can be some hemorrhages inside the liver. And well, this is a very dangerous state. So uh, when we're talking about different consequences done to a spleen, to a liver, well, even well, uh, two weeks may be a long uh, period to uh, treat your wound with a silver containing wound dressing, but uh, uh, you should understand that uh, the mouse, the rat model, are a bit different from a human model. And uh, the rats, they are much tougher uh, than a human. So uh, if we, for example, compare six weeks of treatment of rat with this wound dressing, it will be probably equivalent to one week in human. So we are much weaker than animal uh, if we are talking about some survival aspects. So some of the animals can survive, survive a very high concentration of nanoparticles, but human can't. Uh, so this is a very important uh, uh, thing to concern when we're talking about toxicity of nanoparticles. Uh, and well, probably, uh, I'm not sure, maybe this is the last one, about lungs toxicity. So, as you probably already know, lungs are, again, one of the most, uh, main organs which accumulate particles, but lungs, uh, but accumulating of nanoparticles and filtration of nanoparticles, it's not a primary function of lungs, uh, because lungs, the primary fun function is oxidation of our hem uh, hemoglobin and so on, so breathing, uh, and... Uh, uh, why is this is so important? Well, because we're breathing with some air, polluted air, uh, containing some nanoparticles. And these nanoparticles can enter our body through our lungs, and lungs can accumulate some of them. But also what is so important uh, is that some of the uh, nanoparticle uh, uh, injection in our body not very convenient in form of intravenous injection. So... Uh, you should have some skills to inject something uh, in your body by yourself or you need some medic uh, uh, some doctors to to inject something in you uh, for example you need some involuntary treatment and so on 
and there's some options to develop some nanoparticles that can be inhaled for example in form of different sprays that can be used uh, to treat some lungs uh, inflammation some lungs uh, diseases and one of the most uh, widespread uh, type of nanoparticles that used to for in, uh, in, uh, inhale uh, for lungs treatment is albumin nanoparticles uh, and why albumin nanoparticles is used for this purpose? Because they are easily accumulating lungs. Uh, that's the purpose. Uh, if you're looking on accumulation of albumin nanoparticles compared to just albumin, you can, uh, you can see that the accumulation, total accumulation in body, up to 100%. So if you inhale some albumin containing nanoparticle, almost all of them will accumulate in your lungs. So from this point of view, it is very, uh, very beneficial to deliver something to your lungs using inhaled albumin nanoparticles. But still, even albumin nanoparticles can be toxic because a lot of albumin in your lungs can uh, lead to some damage to cell metabolism and so on. Uh, and well, from lungs, these nanoparticles uh, later, uh, later, uh, earlier or later will end up in some of other monocyte phagocytic system organs, for example, in liver. Uh, but just for you to remember, if you want to deliver something in lungs, you, it's the best option to use for now. It's the best option to use some albumin nanoparticles. Uh, but again, a, a bit of uh, how the lungs working. So just for you to understand, uh, well, we have some uh, not very complex structure of uh, uh, some uh, respiratory system, and uh, on the end of our bronchial tube, there's some uh, so-called bronchial, and on this bronchial. Uh, we have some alveoli sacs, and these sacs are used, well, they can uh, expand uh, with the air, and uh, there's, you can say, veins, arteries, and, well, there's uh, oxidation of hemoglobin, so your blood will receive some oxygen. Uh, and uh, since there's a lot of different vessels around your alveoli sacs, uh, it's uh, of course a lot of interaction with this uh, with some nanoparticles. For example, uh, as, uh, here is inside of alveoli sac. As you can see, there's endothelium lining, and uh, of course there's some fluid because we have fluids in our lungs in some uh, amount. And if you have some nanoparticles inhaled, they will pass through these membranes and they can accumulate in, for example, interstitium or they can accumulate in alveolar, uh, alveolar epithelium and so on. Well, of course, they, uh, from the lungs, they can go to uh, lymph nodes, uh, regional lymph nodes, and uh, from this they can end up in uh, some other organs, probably in spleen and uh, also in liver, in kidneys, and even in fetus, some kind of nanoparticles can accumulate. Uh, but what happens to, for example, if we have some not albumin nanoparticles for treatment, but some nanoparticles from our environmental pollution, uh, like titanium dioxide particles or cobalt particles uh, and so on, uh, if you look here, it's a normal uh, histology image of the lungs. As you can see here, it's an uh, alveolar sp space, so alveolar sac. And uh, this is endothelium cells uh, on the surface, so endothelium lining. And after treatment with titanium dioxide, there is no much difference. So everything is looking just like a contour sample. But if we're looking on nano-cobalt particles, uh, well, everything looking completely different and as you can see this still is uh, showing alveolar sac but where is endothelium it's a very very damaged endothelium it's a lot of different macrophages shown by these arrows and if we look in it's like uh, seven days and this is like four months uh, and if we're looking on uh, some uh, high concentration of cobalt particles uh, you will see a uh, pulmonary fib fibrosis. So it's a lot of connective, uh, connective tissues in lungs uh, and especially here. 
just compare this sample and this sample. So this is endocellular cells, uh, different alveolar sacs and so on. And this is mostly a connectivity tissue. So this, uh, this lungs will lose its ability to provide a contraction. So uh, human or animal, it doesn't matter, will lose its uh, part of its fun uh, functionality of its lungs and uh, it will lead to some very serious problems with breathing. Uh, so almost the same as we have after COVID disease, so some fibrosis of our lungs. Uh, and uh, well, all of this is caused by nanoparticles. So this is the first slide I want to show to you today. So if you have any questions, you are welcome to ask in the chat or ask me personally, because in 15 minutes or maybe 10 minutes, uh, we're moving to Zoom session and three of you should present your topics. I hope everyone in a good health state and able to present. So three people today, four people next Friday at la and last three people will be on Wednesday next week and please again do not forget to download your reports in common folder here so student reports for now it's just Alexander who download its report and presentation so without your report you will have minus 20 points in your final grade so it's very important part of your initial final uh, final assessment. Do not forget to upload. So if you don't have any questions, I will see you in Zoom like in 10 minutes.